Hello, hello and welcome back to CS 300 Introduction to Algorithm. Um, today we want to talk about randomized algorithms. So randomized algorithms are a powerful paradigm beyond the paradigms we've discussed so far. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the motivation, the reliability or unreliability of randomized algorithms. We will discuss sources of randomness um, um, in, from the perspective of um, algorithmically and uh, engineering. We discuss two types of classes of randomized algorithms, Las Vegas versus Monte Carlo algorithms. We will see an example uh, application of randomized algorithm, namely primality testing, testing whether given a natural number is a prime number or not. Um, we'll cover uh, errors uh, of randomized algorithms formally and uh, amplification that decreases the probability for randomized algorithms to make such errors. And uh, then we'll See another example application of randomized algorithm, maybe uh, so-called black box polynomial testing, uh, zero test for polynomials, and an application, uh, its analysis based on the schwartz sippel lemma, and as application, um, uh, very efficient um, and elegant algorithm for uh, finding perfect matchings in graph, deciding whether the graph has a perfect matching or not, uh, using the TUT determinant. Yeah, there are also deterministic algorithms for perfect matching, very famous one, um, but uh, uh, arguably the randomized algorithm is both uh, ele more elegant and uh, still uh, as practical. So what's with the reliability? If you think about it, uh, um, then the advent of uh, digital te technology, right? So everything is digital these days, uh, all an analog, uh, no, formal analog uh, processing like uh, 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 radio or telephone or television used to be analog in the old days. They are now all uh, become dig digitalized. And there's a reason for that, namely, uh, uh, while analog signals degrade uh, over uh, the course of a transmission, right, like a, a, a video signal from the camera via the transmitter uh, uh, or, um, to the TV um, uh, appliance, there's a lot of signal processing going on and at each stage adds some noise to the signal so that in the end, uh, the signal may uh, be very unreliable. Whereas, uh, well, the same is true to be fair also for digital signals, but since digital signals only have values zero or one, have uh, 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 five volt or zero volt in uh, original TTL logic, uh, there it is easy to recover the original uh, signal because a small perturbation, as long as it does not uh, convert zero to one, uh, can recover. So one can kind of repair at each stage of the transmission process and recover the original digital signal so that even through many uh, uh, stages of transmission, like for example, internet, uh, through many routers, the signal still at the destination, the original information uh, arrives uh, because at each uh, stage, a signal is, is recovered. So reliability is, uh, is really the key to efficient uh, uh, um, uh, digital data processing technology. Why would we even want to uh, uh, revert to unreliability and to randomization. Um, and the reason is that, um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, let's, let's discuss how reliable 
uh, current uh, personal computers actually are. So contemporary PCs easily have 10 to the nine gates in the CPU operating, right? Um, that's uh, like one, one billion of, of, of uh, transistors. And uh, running at a one gigahertz uh, frequency means that the gates are flipping at 10 to the nine times per second. That's, that's an incredible number of uh, 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 flipping <laughs> going on. Uh, and if any of these flips uh, go wrong, then the whole computation uh, processing may, may blow up uh, like a blue screen or something. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, this, uh, to achieve this, really engineering had to make huge uh, efforts. Namely, uh, for example, there's uh, radiation uh, entering the, the memory chips or the CPU chips and that um, can flip a bit, particularly when the charge that represents bit uh, one, uh, elementary charge is uh, comparable to the uh, charge of an electron, then uh, one hit by a cosmic particle, uh, alpha, beta, gamma particle can flip such a bit. So in order to, um, yeah, there's a classical studies of the effect of cosmic rays on computer memories and in the uh, early days, the first uh, uh, computing cluster, for example, was a, a, a cluster of Apple computers, but there were so many of them and they had so large memory that the probability for one of the bits, memory bits of one of the computers to fail was kind of like uh, the certainty that uh, it had to re be rebooted roughly once a day. And uh, uh, because of all this uh, cosmic rays that uh, uh, come from the atmosphere and uh, hit this memory bits. So that's a typical uh, example table of the memory errors per year uh, and different uh, technologies and sizes of memory. And in order to avoid that, uh, efforts had to be made like introducing error correcting codes uh, and storing more bits. So typically for uh, eight bit memory, uh, that is one byte, uh, actual uh, memory uh, chips, you store nine bits, one additional parity bit that allows to detect when whether some bit has been flipped. So that's the first kind of error correction detecting errors using a parity. The next stage is correcting um, errors. Um, and the next stage is detecting two-bit errors. So that's a different levels of reliability and they come at the case of having to uh, implement uh, uh, redundancy in engineering. But uh, long story short, all this has been um, achieved and uh, contributed to the success of contemporary digital processing technology. So why would we even want to revert that and introduce randomness? And there are uh, several reasons. The first reason is efficiency. It turns out uh, that uh, randomized algorithms um, can work, uh, be very efficient, uh, more efficient apparently uh, apparently, I have to emphasize, then deterministic, uh, the known deterministic algorithms for uh, several of the problems that we're going to illustrate here in this course. Second um, um, motivation is the elegance. Often a randomized algorithm turns out to be much more elegant than the corresponding uh, deterministic algorithm if a uh, uh, deterministic algorithm uh, is known uh, of uh, similar efficiency, then it tends to be much more involved, uh, for example, in terms of implementation. And the third motivation is that the reliability that we're giving up with randomized algorithms, randomized algorithms can and may and will make errors, that this reliability can be made uh, so small that it becomes comparable to the remaining 
uh, very low unreliability that remains, right? So imagine an uh, algorithm that uh, fails with a probability of two to the minus 100. So this is uh, still possible, uh, conceivable, uh, in spite of all the error correction uh, due to this uh, um, uh, cosmic rays, uh, error probability, even for deterministic algorithms, the, um, the underlying hardware is kind of um, non-deterministic uh, um, due to the cosmic rays, for example. But with an error probability of two to the minus 100 of a, a randomized algorithm, um, this uh, error probability becomes negligible compared to the engineering pro probability of engineering uh, errors. And also two to the minus 100 is uh, so uh, from all practical purposes is as good as deterministic. So that's uh, uh, the third reason. Now let's discuss um, the sources of randomness. Uh, as I've uh, emphasized, engineering has been put in huge efforts and has been extremely successful in kind of driving out all possible um, 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 sources of uh, uh, randomness or unreliability and to make the uh, hardware as deterministic as you can hope for. Um, so that uh, now we're in the paradoxical situation that it uh, has become very hard to generate randomness uh, algorithmically using uh, our uh, hardware, right? And if you think about it, I mean, um, the mo most physical laws are actually deterministic, right? Newton's laws, all these laws. So how can we even uh, create reliable randomness, right? That's, uh, that's maybe the paradox, right? A reliable randomness, um, once we've achieved all the, uh, uh, driven out all randomness and achieved full reliability. And there's, uh, uh, physically speaking, there's uh, various sources to obtain such entropy from, for example, the heat, right? Uh, heat is a, is a kind of entropy and thus uh, maybe a source to be harnessed. The user, the user's behavior, the person in front of the computer, uh, may or may not behave uh, unpredictably. And this is, has been tried to be harnessed as a source of entropy for randomness. And, uh, but the uh, physically a fundamental source is quantum mechanics, which says basically that uh, any measurement process uh, is inherently random and uh, thus possible source of randomness. Um, uh, the disadvantage is that all these sources have a low rate, right? So we're talking like 100 or 1000 random bits per second, maybe 10,000 random bits per second, which is much, much smaller than the uh, billion, right? Billions of uh, bit operations that uh, uh, contemporary PCs can perform in one second. So producing truly random bits is a much, much slower process. Similar like, you know, the comparison between uh, um, the relation between uh, uh, a hard disk, a uh, magnetic rotating hard disk and uh, uh, level one cache. Uh, it's a similar uh, discrepancy in efficiency. Yes, and with truly random bits, I mean those that are uh, really uncorrelated and two subsequent uh, bits should be entirely independent, uh, statistically speaking, and they should be unbiased. Uh, unbiased uh, um, can be biased can be removed by combining sequences of uh, uh, longer sequence of random bits. That's uh, what uh, Donald Knuth already observed long ago. But correlation that's uh, hard really to even detect and. Uh, uh, that uh, leads us to the uh, area of uh, uh, algorithmic randomness, uh, like uh, multi-left tests for correlation 
uh, algorithmically detecting correlations. Um, so that should be good enough, right? So when we're not really interested in fully mathematical uncorrelation that cannot be detected algorithmically, but uh, the correlation should be uh, algorithmically undetectable. And this is what Martin left randomness covers and has spawned an entirely uh, interesting field of algorithmic uh, information. So um, since this is all costly, uh, one often re resorts to pseudo-randomness, not truly random. Uh, bit sequence as a, a formalization of coin flips, but pseudo-random sequence, which uh, uh, is, a, is a kind of oxymoron because the sequence is actually deterministic. Um, uh, the, the start, the seed, better be fully uh, random, but then the next uh, sequence uh, elements of the sequence are calculated efficiently and thus uh, deterministically and thus efficiently with the gigahertz. So this means uh, it's a kind of a way of, uh, how to say, diluting uh, 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 an original short but truly random sequence into a longer uh, pseudo random sequence. Okay. Now let's uh, discuss two uh, prototype types of randomized algorithms, uh, Las Vegas and Monte Carlo algorithms. And they share that both algorithms may make mistakes, right? That's a, uh, that's a kind of trade-off. We uh, introduce randomness uh, at the, uh, and thus, uh, but this randomness may lead algorithms to make mistakes. And the difference between the two algorithms is how they, uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, work with these mistakes or um, also the running time becomes now a random variable, right? So when flipping coins in one way, then one algorithm may actually run longer than on a different choice of coin flips for the same input. So that now the running time depends not only on the input, but also on the sequence of coin flips. So let's discuss these uh, two types of algorithms and uh, have a brief recap. Um, you might want to look back at uh, your uh, course on the discrete mathematics about probability, uh, finite or countable probability spaces, conditional probabilities, uh, definitions of random variable, of stochastic independence, what is the expectation of a random variable, um, base uh, um, theorem, that's uh, what we're going to use here. And now um, this is Las Vegas. This is what gave the name to the uh, Las Vegas type algorithms. And this is Monte Carlo that gave name to the Monte Carlo type algorithms too capitals of, uh, of gambling, if you wish. Uh, Las Vegas algorithm uh, are characterized that there don't make errors. Their result must always be correct. And this comes at a cost, uh, namely that the running time analysis that we perform is a expected runtime uh, uh, analysis expected running time with respect to the coin flips that the algorithm performs. So running this algorithm a second time could, uh, will again produce the same correct result, but possibly um, at a different running time. And we hope that the expected running time is polynomial, but that means that it is still possible that for some uh, sequence of coin flips, the running time be exponential as long as that happens very rarely. Um, Monte Carlo algorithms, on the other hand, may make mistakes. They are only probably correct in a sense that the probability for them to make an error should be small. We're going to formalize that in a minute. But here, on the other hand, the running time uh, is guaranteed to be, for example, polynomial. So that's kind of the two. Uh, antipodes of randomized algorithms, 
uh, how their behavior, how the good or bad sequence of coin flips affect uh, um, the uh, behavior, the output of uh, this algorithm. And uh, let's uh, recall a particular example of quicksort. Uh, so as you may recall, quicksort without the linear time medium has a uh, um, worst case quadratic time behavior. So, um, but this is a rare case. So randomized quicksort, which chooses the pivot randomly is an example of a, a Las Vegas algorithm. Of course, the result is always a correctly sorted sequence, but the running time is uh, n log n only in the expected case, whereas it is quadratic n squared in the worst case. Let's now move on to discuss uh, uh, one particular example, namely primality testing. Primality testing is the problem of deciding whether a given natural number is prime number or composite. So uh, here's a decision problem. Input is a natural number and the output is yes or no, the generic decision problem. Uh, yes, when the input belongs to L and no, when the input does not belong to L. And uh, Primality testing is a decision problem referring to the set L of prime numbers. And this is, uh, for example, implemented in, uh, in computer algebra systems with a predicate uh, is prime. And uh, uh, well, one naive approach, for example, using the sieve of Eratosthenes tests all possible divisors, um, but this is an exponential time algorithm exponential in the binary length of the input, polynomial in the value of the input, but exponential in the binary length. And uh, in 2002, uh, Agarwal, Kayal, and Saxena uh, found, uh, designed, and proved and analyzed at the first deterministic polynomial primality test. Here, n to the seven, where n is the binary length of the input, not the value of the input. Mm. So that's a deterministic test, but as you recall, the advantages of uh, randomized tests are first their efficiency. So here the deterministic test is polynomial, but it's a very high degree polynomial n to the seven. And second, it's uh, elegance. The deterministic test is very uh, involved to implement, whereas the randomized test we will see is much easier um, to implement. So more efficient and more elegant, easier to implement. So um, yeah, you might think uh, naively that uh, how about simply guessing a proper divisor of the input and verifying whether given divisor really divides the input that's easy. Thus we can maybe easily refute a number from being prime. But uh, uh, this uh, naive approach has um, um, two disadvantages. First, it's about, uh, yeah, it's a one-sided test, right? It refutes um, uh, um, a number of being prime number and the probability for this uh, uh, refuting uh, is, is very low actually, right? So if you think of a, a number that is the product of two primes, right? Then in order to uh, yeah, refute this, it's not a prime number, it's a product of two primes, but refuting that with the naive algorithm requires the algorithm to guess really one of the two factors. Um, and uh, um, so that means uh, guessing uh, every single bit of the factor uh, correctly, and that's highly unlikely. So that's not a reliable algorithm, uh, far from being a Las Vegas uh, algorithm. Um, or if we want to put differently, if we want to trade the 
uh, reliability for increase in running time, then we have to repeat that algorithm very often in order to uh, obtain a constant error probability. That's our uh, general goal for, um, for uh, Monte Caldo algorithm, constant error probability. So, um, so this naive idea of a randomized algorithm is not a good randomized algorithm because either the error probability is extremely large or close to one or the running time uh, after the trade-off becomes uh, uh, again exponential in the binary links. Um, remember, we want to analyze everything in depends on the binary links, which is basically the logarithm of the uh, natural number. Um, another approach that uh, is, turns out as trivial is uh, determine the algorithm that is correct on average. Right? Do we want to have such an algorithm? Right? Uh, so the counter example that we just discussed where the naive algorithm uh, fails with high probability, fails with high probability, well, probability close to one at refuting uh, com composite number. Um, that's uh, one uh, counter example input. If we're uh, considering algorithms to be correct on average, then again, the setting becomes trivial. Let me simply say composite. It's the composite correct answer for almost all inputs, right? Because by the prime number theorem, most natural numbers are composite. So an algorithm that doesn't even look at the number, just say composite, um, is correct on average. But of course, that's not really helpful. So that's not the right notion. So um, what is the right notion? Um, the right notion is we want an algorithm to uh, give the correct answer with, uh, let's say at least with constant probability, strictly smaller than, uh, uh, than zero. And this is what is achieved by the Miller-Rabin test. The Miller-Rabin test guesses an, on input X, guesses some natural number less than X, a, a, X then decomposes the number x minus one um, into um, its uh, binary uh, yeah, uh, powers of two and the uh, odd part, and then um, uses the uh, uh, following necessary property for prime numbers, namely that uh, in this decomposition, raising a to the dth power, where these uh, odd part of x minus one modular x um, is going to be not congruent to one and raising a to the d times two to the r is also not going to be congruent to minus one modular x for all r less than e. So observe that e, the value e, uh, is uh, logarithmic in, in X, right? This is what we want. And testing all R's less than E are, there are polynomially many such R's, uh, polynomially in the binary length of, R, of X. So testing this condition star is, uh, can be done in polynomial time, um, poly time polynomial in the binary length of the input. Yeah, uh, let me say that again, they are at most, Polynomially many such R's, values R that are to be tested here, polynomially in the binary length of X. And then there's also this, uh, this uh, raising A to this high power, um, uh, which we cannot do, should not do by repeatedly multiplying A D times, because that would be again exponentially many multiplications. Uh, see that these can be, uh, roughly same magnitude as X. So it's the value is the same as X. Then the binary length is uh, exponential in X, uh, but we can uh, implement this uh, modular exponentiation using repeated squaring, applying the modulus, modular remainder after each uh, uh, round of repeated squaring in order to make sure that the intermediate results 
remain short. So um, in summary, this test star can be, uh, is, uh, gives rise to polynomial time algorithm. Uh, again, I'm not going to spell that out in any kind of pseudocode. You can do that yourself. And the statement uh, uh, observed by Miller Rabin is that uh, this is a, 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 a sufficient condition for X to be composite. Um, and uh, the theorem says that, uh, yeah, that's true. Whenever this condition holds, then X is composite. The converse does not hold, um, but uh, um, it is uh, the converse holds for a constant fraction of all possible uh, values A less than X. So when A less than X is guessed randomly, then the error probability um, is, uh, is uh, 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 small, uh, strictly smaller than uh, strictly um, smaller than one. Uh, so we have uh, that the miller rabin test in this sense is a constant error probability. Polynomial time algorithm, uh, randomized polynomial time algorithm with constant error probability. So, Yeah, and what we next want to talk about is how to amplify that constant error probability. I mean, error probability of 90% is still pretty bad, right? Would we uh, rely on something that makes mistakes with uh, probability 90%? Certainly not. Well, here the error probability is 75%, um, uh, uh, right? So. Uh, with probability 25% uh, that's, uh, that the converse holds. So that means with probability 75% uh, the error algorithm makes a, a mistake in the second case, in the second case. So this is an example of a randomized algorithm with one-sided error. So let's talk about how to uh, decrease the probability uh, error probability for randomized algorithm with one-sided errors. And then we're going to talk about how to decrease the uh, pro error probability for algorithms with two-sided errors, randomized algorithm. So here we are. So this is about uh, um, uh, error amplification. So first case, consider an algorithm, randomized algorithm with one-sided error. Um, one-sided error uh, means false positives only. So for the fa false positive, it means the algorithm says yes, although the input does not belong to L. That's a false positive. Um, or the other type of one-sided error is only false negatives, where the algorithm may say no also for inputs uh, X that belong to L. And we consider any of the two cases, but only one of the two cases, one-sided error. Um, and let's say the algorithm uh, makes such errors with probably with possibly very high probability, very close to one, but strictly less than one. If the error probability is equal to one, then uh, yeah, we cannot do anything about this, right? That's uh, error probability one is basically means the algorithm simply flips, flips a coin. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, the algorithm, for example, a false positive means uh, that the algorithm always says yes, then the error probability is one. And uh, such a trivial algorithm, of course, cannot be amended or repaired. But if we have uh, uh, really uh, one-sided error probability strictly less than one, then we can amplify the algorithm to decrease, to reduce the error probability by running the algorithm repeatedly. Let's say we run the algorithm A with one-sided error probability. We run that for K times. And we check whether the algorithm returns no all the time. So let's consider the algorithm many orgs 
only makes false negative. And if the algorithm returns no during each of the K rounds, then we're going to say, uh, yeah, probably the algorithm knows what it's been doing. And we're going to our new algorithm uh, or um, amplified algorithm A prime, then will return no. Whereas if any of the K runs returns yes, then also our algorithm A prime will return yes. So that's uh, amplification. And let's analyze uh, this. And uh, what is the probability for this repeated uh, amplified error to make a mistake? Well, it makes a mistake only if all K runs of the original algorithm make a mistake, right? So that's where the one-sidedness enters. And uh, since every new execution of the original algorithm uh, uh, starts again flipping coins independently, that means that the probability of erroring is independent for each new run. And the probability being independent for each new run means uh, that the uh, overall probabilities multiply, right? Independent events have uh, multiply their probabilities. And uh, so doing that K times means that the uh, probability, error probability of the original algorithm gets raised to the K's power. And uh, since the original probability was less than one, raising that to the K's power becomes much, much smaller than one tends to zero exponentially fast. And thus the uh, error probability becomes very, very small suddenly. This is uh, amplification of the error. Here's an example. Let's suppose that the original algorithm errors with a very high probability, 99% error probability. That's terrible, right? But we repeat that algorithm 77,000 times, 70 times 100. I'll explain why you decompose this. Uh, repeating that algorithm 7,000 times is no um, deal, right? It's, it's easy to do that in a loop algorithmically. So here we have the example of elegance. We have the example just repeated. We have the example uh, of, uh, of efficiency. 7,000 is not, not a big deal with nowadays gigahertz computers. Um, and let's do the math, um, uh, yeah, maybe in a, in a homework. So that concludes our amplification for one-sided error. Two-sided error uh, algorithms with two-sided errors uh, are a little bit more involved uh, in amplification. That means algorithms that may make both false positives and false negatives. So here's the uh, way to amplify such an algorithm B with some making both false positives and false negatives. Again, our new amplified algorithm B prime is going to repeat the original algorithm B for a certain number K of times. And now it's going to report the majority answer, right? So uh, whichever answer is uh, more frequent, yes or no, will be the answer of the uh, amplified error in the two-sided case. Um, and uh, here we need to impose the hypothesis that the original algorithm has error probability less than 50%. Right? So with one error, sided error probability, we had the hypothesis that the probability is less than one. With two-sided error, we need to have the probability less than 50% because um, Again, when the probability is equal to 50%, that can easily be achieved by a trivial algorithm that again does not even look at the input and only flips a random coin, right? So this is how the kind of trivial algorithms, algorithm that ignores the input and just flips a random coin, uh, easily achieves prob probability 50%, but there's no, that's no useful algorithm that can be amplified or in any sense, right? So here we suppose that the error probability is strictly less than 50%. Uh, so, and uh, here the analysis uh, is more involved uh, than with simple independence of the random events. Let me, um, it uses Höfting's inequality um, 
uh, let uh, x1 to xk be independent random variable uh, and imagine each of these random variables to be the uh, one execution of the original algorithm and let the random variables be in zero one that's a mathematical hypothesis of Hefting's inequality and the application imagine that the random variables are zero or one only not general real numbers, but only zero or one, depending, um, reflecting true or false, yes or no, as answer of the execution. And uh, now consider the average answer kind of, right? So, which is an uh, real number and uh, reporting the majority means that the algorithm report yes, if the average is uh, larger than 50% and will answer now, if the average is, is less than 50%. So this is the average. And breaking ties arbitrarily if the average happens to be equal to 50%. Um, and the probability now for the actual uh, average to exceed the expected value um, by more than t becomes exponentially small in t. That's the idea. Um, so being further off from the average becomes increasingly improbable. Uh, also, it becomes increasingly improbable as the number of K of independent random variables grows. And that's what we do here, right? So repeating that algorithm K times, uh, when K grows, that means that the error probability becomes uh, exponentially smaller than the original error probability. So, um, yeah, so that uh, concludes our discussion of errors of randomized algorithms, one-sided and two-sided errors, and amplifying randomized algorithms to decrease the error probability exponentially, exponentially in the number of repetitions. In the first case, the analysis was easy based on independence, and in the second case, it relies on Höfting's inequality. Okay, so um, again, here's an example. Uh, consider the case where the error probability is one over three, a little less than one over two, but we repeat it 100 times and uh, please calculate by yourself, what is the error probability of the thus um, uh, amplified algorithm? Let's uh, apply this concept to black box polynomial test, um, but um, so what is a black box polynomial test? Black box polynomial test is uh, um, motivated by a common parlor game, 20 questions. In 20 questions, one player is uh, asked to think of a natural number. And the second player is asked to guess that number by asking questions to the first player. The first player has to answer this question accurately. Like for example, is your number even? Yes or no? Is the number you're thinking of greater than 100? Yes or no? And so by using these uh, uh, questions, kind of uh, um, using the first player as a oracle, as a black box answering machine about questions, the goal is to recover uh, the natural number thought of by the first player. And similarly, um, in black box polynomial test, there's a polynomial and one can ask question about that polynomial. Uh, let me ask uh, values for the polynomial. So for example, what is the value of that polynomial on argument five? What is P of five? And P denotes that polynomial. What is P of seven? What is P of uh, uh, 50? And uh, by repeatedly asking these questions, the goal is here is to recover the polynomial, its coefficients of the polynomial that the first player is thinking of. 
Um, and now let's turn that algorithmic. Um, so let's consider some fixed unknown polynomial P, the polynomial that maybe one player or one algorithm has implemented. And the goal of a, our algorithm is to recover the coefficients of that polynomial or more uh, simply uh, to find out whether this is the zero polynomial. So not only not the coefficients, but the, the play, more plain question, is it a zero polynomial or not? And uh, um, so uh, the blue box represents here the black box, the player that we can ask. We ask here questions like uh, input X and the player will answer what is the value of that polynomial on argument X, for example, mod is P of 17. And by asking a sufficient number of this type of formalized question, uh, our algorithm is supposed to find out whether it's a zero polynomial or not. Now, this is an example of a one-sided uh, error test, right? Because if the value returned uh, P of 17 is non-zero, then definitely this is not the zero polynomial. But if the value of P of 17 happens to be zero, then this may or may not be the zero polynomial. Maybe coincidentally 17 happens to be a root of this otherwise non-zero polynomial. So uh, that's a one-sided test. One a non-zero answer immediately entails that the polynomial is non-zero, but the zero answer may or may not could be due to a zero polynomial. So, but then we let's uh, our algorithm can ask another question like, what is p of five? Again, if the answer is non-zero, then it's not a zero polynomial. It's again zero. Then intuitively the chances are increased that it is actually the zero polynomial, right? So by um, repeatedly asking such questions for values of P of X at various X's um, should uh, kind of uh, lead to a, a more and more certainty. If each one tells that the value is zero, then maybe it is the zero and the identically zero polynomial. Uh, and the fundamental theorem of algebra says that uh, a polynomial of degree D, non-zero polynomial can have at most uh, D different roots in the complex case, precisely D different roots. So by uh, asking this question for D plus one different argument X, one can deterministically recover whether P is the zero polynomial or not in the one dimensional case, the univariate case. So uh, that's a generic black box test, fix a finite subset D, let's say of integers, choose a random point in D, that's a randomization part uh, of this black box test, uniformly at random, Evaluate P on that argument, what is P of X? If it's uh, non-zero, then definitely it's not a zero polynomial. If it's S zero, then that's the one-sided error, may or may not be the zero polynomial, but our algorithm, generic algorithm is going to be bold and just claim that it is the zero polynomial. And if we can make this error to have uh, um, probability less than one, then we're in business because you recall, then we can amplify by repeating that algorithm and thus decrease the probability for it to, to err, uh, to make it exponentially small. Um, yes, and as I said, due to the fundamental theorem of algebra, um, we need some kind of promise, namely that the, prom the promise that the polynomial under consideration has degree at most D. Uh, right, the zero polynomial by convention has degree minus infinity. So here we say uh, that the polymer has degree at most D. Um, so that means that repeating this test, the D plus one times kind of uh, 
gives a deterministic test in the univariate case, um, right? So univariate polynomial of degree at most D can have at most D roots or so testing D plus one distinct arguments deterministically answers the question whether it's a zero polynomial. But um, here we're interested in the more, uh, in the multivariate case where all this uh, breaks down, right? A multivariate polynomial, uh, here's a non-zero bivariate polynomial, x squared plus y squared minus one. How many roots does that polynomial have? Well, the roots of that polynomial are precisely the numbers on the unit uh, um, circle in the plane, right? And there are uncountably infinitely many roots of this polynomial. So it's degree two, but it has infinitely many roots. So the fundamental theorem of algebra totally breaks down here in this case. And that's our, our, also our first naive initial analysis of the generic black box test, uh, uh, just repeating that algorithm uh, D plus one times uh, does not yield uh, uh, deterministic tests because may happen that each of these D plus one times it hits one of the infinitely many roots on the uh, unit circle um, if it makes real guesses, right? So um, uh, the next slide we're going to uh, uh, analyze the generic black box polynomial test in the multivariate case. And to this end, we need a, a multivariate generalization of the degree, right? So there are actually two types of degree for multivariate polynomials. One is called total degree. The other is called maximum degree. Total degree um, is the sum of the powers of each polynomial, for, for example, x squared times y to the third has total degree five. The maximum degree is three. It's governed by y to the third. So um, here we're going to consider the total degree on the next slide. And this is a, a Schwarz-Zippel lemma, uh, which is a famous analysis of uh, this uh, generic randomized algorithm, not because it's so involved, but in, it's quite the opposite because the schwarz lemma is so simple and its proof is so uh, uh, really elegant. So this is a, uh, was proven independently by Schwarz and Zippel and turned out that Litten and DeMillo proved the uh, this statement uh, uh, even before that, but it happens to in the literature under the name Schwarz-Zippel lemma. The following statement, if we fix a finite set S, imagining this to be the set of samples, set of a subset of N uh, um, dimensional uh, uh, vectors, and uh, suppose that the polynomial P, N variant polynomial, uh, with coefficients is non-zero and has total degree less or equal to the total degree, right? And now let's suppose we sample um, uh, elements, uh, n elements from S independently, uniformly at random. Then the probability that this sample uh, um, is a root of this polynomial non-zero polynomial is at most D, the total degree, divided by the sample size S, the size of the sample set. So that is a very succinct statement about the probability for a random sample to hit a root of this multivariate polynomial. And that's a great generalization of the univariate case. Remember in the univariate case, um, uh, what is the probability? So when n is equal to one, what is the probability of hitting a root of this polynomial? Well, the probability is uh, d divided by s. Uh, why is it d divided by s? Well, the probability 
of uh, uh, um, right so d because there are d possible roots right that's the total number of events uh, of positive events right uh, numerator d positive events divided by the total number of events the total number of events is the set uh, sample size right so uh, the univariate case this is uh, immediately uh, just uh, you know the definition of probability divided to, uh, number of good events when they divided by the number of total events. And uh, schwartz sippel lemma uh, says that this generalizes to the uh, multivariate case. So um, let's prove this. And uh, when proving this, uh, we're going to use the following uh, estimate based on a base law. Right, so we're going to use the following uh, estimate. The probability for an event A uh, is the probability for the event A and B plus the probability for event A and not B. This is simply the uh, uh, decompose, uh, decomposing the event A into those where also event B holds and those where event B does not hold, it's disjoint and therefore yeah, it's the sum of the probabilities. But now comes the estimate. In the first case, the probability is at most the probability of the event B without A, right? So we, that's monotonicity. We increase the, made the event larger, thus it only increase the probability, plus the probability of the event A under conditional to not B uh, times the probability of not B. Um, yeah, this is uh, simply the, um, uh, yeah, remember conditional probability, what you see here. Um, this is uh, the same as uh, uh, the probability of uh, event A and not B spelled out using Bayes' law. So only the first part is where we estimate and the second part is uh, e equal to this um, according to Bayes' law. This is what we're going to use. And then we're going to drop the last factor, um, which is uh, less or equal to one as any probability. And thus we make it only larger. So this is the final form of the inequality that we now apply in our proof. And the proof is a very elegant uh, induction on the number of variables. Um, so uh, we write this invariant polynomial, non-zero polynomial, as a univariate polynomial in the last variable, the nth variable, but with coefficients which are in terms polynomial in the other variables. We say that again, that's a, a way of uh, looking at poly multivariate polynomials as univariate polynomials whose coefficients are again polynomials of uh, uh, one variable less. Uh, this is what we do for the purpose sake of analysis. And in this polynomial, the, the, thus the composed poly univariate polynomial, uh, some of the coefficients may be identically zero, right? So zero now means uh, identically zero as polynomials. Um, and we're going to look at the largest index J, the largest power in the la nth variable for which this uh, polynomial coefficient is not identically zero. Such a J must exist, right? Because it's uh, the original polynomial is not the zero polynomial. So at least one of the coefficients polynomials must be not identically zero. And we take the largest one in this analysis. Um, and we estimate the probability that uh, our random sample of N elements hits a root by decomposing the uh, sampling process into uh, first sampling the first n minus one variables uh, and then sampling the nth variable or uh, the other way around it doesn't matter because these are independent that's important here because the individual samples are supposed to be independent now according to uh, our below um, general estimate this probability we can uh, estimate or bound from above 
Uh, what, so this is our event A, right? So this is going to be our event A that the sample hits a zero from the polynomial. And the event B is going to be the condition that the J's uh, coefficient polynomial in n minus one variables is uh, the zero polynomial. So this is a condition which we're going to use in our induction. And according to this below estimate, uh, our original probability is at most the probability for this event B that the J's coefficient polynomial in n minus one variables is zero, plus the probability of our original event conditional to the complement of the uh, event B, namely that the J's coefficient polynomial uh, evaluated is not zero. So this is uh, does not mean identically, but evaluated on the first n plus n minus one uh, samples. And uh, now comes the induction hypothesis. Uh, this is a, a, a n minus one variable polynomial. So induction hypothesis applies. And uh, what is this uh, degree? What is the degree of the J's coefficient polynomial? So since we're talking about the total degree, the total degree is D and total degree is the sum of the uh, uh, degrees of this plus the degree of this, the degree of this monomial is J. So that means that the degree of this um, will be uh, J minus, uh, D minus J. And that's where we use the hypothesis that this is a non-zero polynomial. Um, coefficient polynomial. Well, let me say that again. Um, we took a, a one a monomial here uh, where the uh, total degree is attained to be D and thus decomposes into J plus the degree of this coefficient polynomial together make up for D and therefore the degree of this here is equal to D minus J. Now the uh, induction hypothesis says, since this is a random sample of size n minus one of this n minus one variant polynomial, uh, non-zero n minus one variant polynomial by induction hypothesis, the probability for this partial sample to hit the root of this n minus one variant polynomial is at most d minus j divided by the size of the sample set S. Now let's estimate this here, but this is a, just a univariate case polynomial, right? So here we're in the case that we have already evaluated the polynomial coefficient here and converted this into a number, namely the sample values have been inserted. So this is now a number times uh, 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 one variable, the remaining variable, and now we uh, sample the remaining variables. So we have sampled the first n minus one values and now we sample the last one. What is the probability for that to hit the root of this univariate polynomial where this has already become uh, ordinary number coefficient? And uh, that's of course by the fundamental theorem of algebra. As I said, this polynomial of degree uh, it's a polynomial of degree D, uh, um, uh, D right, uh, of degree J, um, right? Yes, that's a polynomial of degree J. Um, um, what is the probability of uh, this last variable to hit the root of this polynomial of degree J? Um, yes, again, this is our number of uh, good events divided by the total number of events that has at most J roots uh, divided by S samples. So it's uh, J divided by S. And so now if we add these two fractions, you see that uh, the denominator is both S and the J cancels. So it becomes D divided by S as claimed here. And this concludes the induction step uh, for N, the number of variables. So as I said, a very elegant lemma. Now, how do we apply that algorithmically? Algorithmically, it seems uh, um, like, uh, well, we can sample these n variables from the set S 
and then evaluate in our black box uh, uh, using a black box algo uh, uh, evaluation and then repeat that right using amplification but what uh, choose what size do we choose for s if we choose s the sample set large then the error probability decreases right you see that here the larger the sample set the smaller the error probability but it decreases only linearly in the size of s so if we want to have an exponentially small error probability it means we need to make the sample set exponentially large this is very inefficient right exponentially large samples that is not good what is much more uh, efficient and practical is to just use the, make choose the sample set of twice the size uh, twice the degree twice the degree as you see here then the error probability is constant and remember that is good enough for us to amplify by simply repeating this algorithm so the uh, message to convey here in order to uh, apply the Schwartz simple lemma algorithmically with an exponentially small error probability. Um, the naive way is to make the sample set exponentially large, but the more uh, practical and efficient way is to make the sample set just twice as large as the degree, not exponentially large, but then to repeat the uh, uh, algorithm independently uh, by using amplification of this one-sided, since it's a one-sided algorithm, we can just repeat it uh, um, uh, sufficiently often to make the error probability exponentially decay exponentially fast. 